Now, I'm sure you know a lot of Republicans are really, really upset. They feel that Republicans so. uh, have taken over the House, taken over the Senate, promised to stop the Obama agenda, but have not been able to stop the Obama agenda. Why not? Well, because I'll tell you the truth, Republicans are loath to fight. They don't like messy, and they don't like to fight. And they love to be able to say what they believe, and they, I, generally, I genuinely believe that they believe what they say. But when they go to Washington, D.C., they just don't have it in them to fight and push back and to make the argument. I think the thing that, to me, is just shocking is uh, where are the, where's the re Republican leadership saying why we shouldn't be funding Obamacare, why we shouldn't be funding the Iran agreement. You name it, one item after another, why we shouldn't be funding it. I, I'll tell you, like, for instance, with the Obamacare debate, I was, I, I was the member of Congress who was the first one to introduce the legislation to repeal Obamacare. There's a story that just came out in my home state of Minnesota. This is the practical downstream of how bad this law is. We just had the uh, increases in health care premiums announced in my home state. And under Obamacare, the insurance premiums for people that are getting these subsidies, they're going up 50%. So here you are, a poor person. You qualify to get the Obamacare subsidy, and your premium's jacking by 50%. That's about as bad as it gets. And so that's why I think people are really fed up. It sounds wonderful on one hand. I think a lot of people thought that Obamacare meant that they were going to get free health care, that somebody else was going to pay for their health care. And then Shazam, they found out that somebody else is somebody else, but it's also me. And it's a lot more expensive than it used to be. Like for millennials, for instance, college kids, they used to be able to get health insurance policies in college for 30 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month. They're kind of real basic policies. You can't even get those policies anymore. They were made illegal. So a lot of college kids and a lot of millennials, the rising generation, are now paying 200, 250 bucks a month for their policy. And it, now this so-called affordable health care policy has gotten pretty darn unaffordable. You won't have any difficulty convincing me that people are fed up and they're unhappy with Obamacare. But when I watch, for example, Jason Chavis on television, uh, who threw his hat in the ring, he's an insurgent, he's a non-establishment Republican, he's one of those who had criticized Boehner, criticized McConnell for not standing up to the Obama agenda. He was asked, would you shut down the government? And he refused to answer. And in my opinion, he refused to answer because he knows the polls show 80% of the Americans don't like it and blame Republicans. So my question, Michelle, really is, on a practical matter, when we talk about stopping the Obama agenda, what literally can Republicans really honestly do? A lot. You wouldn't think so by everything you said out of D.C., but there's a lot. All you have to do is turn to the Constitution and take a look at what powers Congress has in the House of Representatives. They've chosen not to use the power that the, con that the uh, Constitution has given so, them. So are you saying you would, if you were Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. Uh, and, for example, people want to defund uh, Planned Parenthood because of these graphic, horrible videos. Would you be willing to, st to shut down the government? Well, let's clarify, first of all. The one who said that he will shut down the government is Barack Obama. He said he will shut it down. And he said that he would shut it down over a few different areas, one being the funding of his Iran agreement. Now remember, even President Obama earlier this year admitted Iran will get nuclear weapons under this agreement. He thinks it might be year 13. That's pretty scary to think if they're going to get Michelle, nuclear for, weapons for, by year 13. Forgive me for interrupting. So are you, saying, are you saying that you would shut down the government and then go on television and say, or rather, rather be willing to, to, uh, to defund Obamacare, defund, uh, excuse me, defund Planned Parenthood, not fund the Iran deal, and when Obama says, I'm sorry, I'm going to run the risk of shutting down the government, you then go on television and say, it's not our fault, we're not doing it, the president's doing it, and hope that you win the media argument? Is that what you're saying? Well, you do it on multiple levels. From a practical point of view, you do it on multiple levels. Again, I spent my life negotiating. I was a United States federal tax litigation attorney, and also we own our own uh, small business. And in a business deal, in a courtroom, in negotiation, you don't give away your position before you even start negotiating. That's what Republicans have been doing time and time again by saying, uh, we're, quote, not going to shut down the government. First of all, I don't buy that premise. 
the Republicans don't even have the ability to shut down the president. It's the president who would veto the bills that come out of Congress. He's the one who would be shutting it down. People at the end of the day don't care who did it. Well, well, they but, just but the, want to know what's happening. Could, and okay, the, the last time the, the government was shut down, it was shut down for 16 days mm -hmm. and then reopened. Everybody who was uh, laid off got all their money back. Yes, that's uh, right. And whatever it was that they wanted to shut the government down for got funded. So my question is... And it's and, happened and, 18 times. And, what and you the, just described happened 18 and times. And the polls show that people do not like it. 80% of the American people say they don't like the government shut down. And the majority blame the Republicans. Whether they should or shouldn't is beside the point. Well, that's because the, the media do. blames the Republicans from Agreed. morning until night. Agreed. And, that's what and most people get their news but from ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, right. Hee Haw. But so they will still blame Republicans. So what do you do about that? Well, you make the case. And Larry, that's what, you know, you have a radio show, you make the case every time you're on, on radio, you take advantage of your opportunity. What is it that Mitch McConnell hasn't done? Make the case. What is it that John Boehner didn't do? Make the case. You have to make the case. President Obama does. He's taken good advantage of the bully pulpit and he's made his case. The Republicans have failed to do that. And that's why I think you see two thirds of the Republican base feel betrayed because they don't see the Republicans in D.C. making the case that they sent them for. So what you do is you say, this is our position. For instance, we're not going to fund the Iran deal, or we're not going to fund uh, every element of Obamacare, because you're not just going to totally defund it in one particular shot. But what you do is you say, this is what we're going to do. You make the case to the American people. You build the support with the American people. But then what you do is you go behind closed doors with the president and his team and you deal. This president hasn't had pushback from the Republicans in Congress since the day he came in. He's been used to getting everything he wants. So of course he's not used to pushback and he assumes everything should go his way. And the sad tragedy is that it has. Michelle, I've never seen a president like this. Uh, in 1992 to 1994, Bill Clinton spent most of his time pushing Hillary Care uh, and gays serving in the op uh, serving openly in the military. And lost the House got for his, the first time in 40 years got, because of Hillary got, Care. Got his butt kicked. Republicans come in. Newt Gingrich becomes Speaker of the House. Clinton moves to the center. He signs a tax cut, capital gains tax cuts. He signed the Welfare Reform Act of 1996. This President Obama stood his ground. Uh, they lost the Ted Kennedy seat in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. I thought at that point he might reconsider Obamacare. Obamacare is unpopular. The Iran deal is unpopular. This man has still not been stopped and has not moved towards the center. Explain that. Well, because he could get away with it. He, he sized up the measure of the Republicans in Congress and saw how weak they were, and he decided, I'm going for it. So it didn't matter if he uh, defied the Constitution or broke federal law, he still went ahead to achieve his goals because he saw that he wouldn't get the pushback. Guess what? That's exactly what uh, Vladimir Putin saw of our president, that Vladimir Putin could go ahead and go into Syria together with Iran. And so for the first time in 40 years, Russia hasn't had a presence in the Middle East. For the first time in 40 years, Russia's back because they took the measure of Barack Obama and said, he's not gonna push us back. We know who he is. And so now Russia's advancing their interests. And let me tell you very briefly what's going on in the Middle East. This is all about Russia and Iran and Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, all the terror boys are coming together. And they want to control chokeholds, including the Chinese. They want to control chokeholds when it comes to oil and when it comes to natural gas. They want to increase their interests in the Eastern Mediterranean and also in um, Syria. But also when you look at um, the Straits of Hormuz and the Gulf of Aden, they want to control all of those chokeholds. The Chinese, over 50% of the world's goods go through the South China Sea. They want to cut off those chokeholds, and we're doing nothing about it, and we're going to wake up one morning, and it won't just be that we got our rear end handed to us in the Middle East like we just did on September 30th. We're going to wake up some morning, and Iran's going to have a nuclear weapon. Then what? then they decide when they control the chokeholds of distribution of energy, then they'll decide who the customers are for oil and natural gas and what the price will be. So enjoy what you're paying now for a gallon of gas. Uh, welcome to $12 a gallon or whatever they want to charge you. It'll be a very different world 
And we need to recognize that foreign policy mistakes matter. And you pay forward for decades when you get it wrong. And this was exactly the one not to get wrong, a nuclear Iran. We'll come back to, uh, we'll come back to foreign policy in a minute. But um, again, getting back to Obama. Uh, Obamacare was unpopular. It is still unpopular, arguably more unpopular than when it was first started. The Iran deal, only 22% people support that. They don't like the idea that Obama is about ready to sign another executive order to expand gun control. Again, I've never seen a politician like this. Most politicians at least read the polls and then veer towards where the polls are. I, I've never seen one like this. Have you? And it's, well, and it's because there aren't opponents that push back. And Mitch McConnell um, in the Senate has so guarded his power as the leader in the Senate, and John Boehner has so guarded his power in the House, they got their priorities wrong. They forgot why they got into those pinnacle positions. The reason was to advance an agenda. It's not a football game where you have um, the Green Bay Packers and the Minnesota Vikings, and one team has to lose at the end of the day. Hopefully in America, we're about making sure that America wins at the end of the day. So it shouldn't be about these political leaders holding on to their power positions. That's pretty petty. There's big, big things at stake, and unfortunately, you saw zero fight coming out of the House, zero fight coming out of the Senate, despite the fact that the gavel was pulled out of Nancy Pelosi's hand in 2010 and given to John Boehner. And then the gavel was pulled out of Harry Reid's hand in 2014 and given to Mitch McConnell. So enough of this, we can't do anything because we don't control the White House. They can do a lot. They've just chosen not to. And Barack Obama has exploited that weakness. I have another question that I find puzzling. Two thirds of the American people believe we're on the wrong track. Economically, believe we're on the wrong track in terms of foreign policy. Yet I just now saw a poll that said if Joe Biden ran, he might very well get elected. How can Joe Biden, who's been his vice president, to my knowledge, has never objected to any decision that Obama has made, be the front runner, assuming he were to get in? If people are that unhappy with how the country is going. That seems completely inconsistent with me. Because people, A, like Joe Biden, they like him, so, so and number two, they see that he's genuine. When you look at Hillary Clinton, and what is it down to now? I, I don't know what the percentage is. Maybe 18% think she's truthful. I mean, you know, the, if there's anything about Hillary Clinton's comments, she's, she's done this to herself. By the comments that she has said, they've proven over and over again not to be truthful. And the reason why this whole email uh, server is such a big deal is because she thought more about her own political career than she did about the national security of the United States. She's a pretty, she was in a pretty important position. When you're the Secretary of State of the country, you're the third most powerful person in the United States. It's a very powerful position. And for her to take her email server, it's not encrypted, it is not secured, and to have it so that it's easily accessible by the Russian, the Chinese, and any other foreign government, and you know they accessed it. If you have the Chinese breaking into the worst data breach ever and 24 million federal employees' data has been stolen, is it, it is in the possession of the Chinese, um, it's very likely they have the possession of a lot more very important secrets from the United States that were contained on her email server, including a year before this all came out, um, in the emails that Mrs. Clinton released, contained the schedule of the U.S. Ambassador to Libya, Chris Stevens. Now this wasn't the schedule on September 11th, 2012 when he was tragically murdered, but his schedule was out there on one email of one day. So this kind of information was available and it is frightening to think of what the rest of the world now knows about the United States. And I sat on Intel Committee. Um, we deal with the nation's classified secrets and, and we deal primarily with terrorism. We had the worst intelligence failures ever, unfortunately, under the Obama administration, including WikiLeaks, including Ed Snowden. And Ed Snowden, who is a, the biggest traitor that America has ever seen, released, he chose to release, over a million classified sensitive documents to the Chinese, to the Russians, including sensitive data that could get American soldiers killed on the battlefield. This is no, this is no hero, this was a great betrayer.
Michelle, I, I, I get that Joe Biden. I get that. Um, but I thought it was the economy stupid. And this president, unless something really happens within the next year and a half, will be the first president to preside over an economic recovery where not one year we have 3% GDP growth. That's exactly not one right. Year. That's Regarding the black economy, black net worth is down 20%. The so-called wealth gap between blacks and whites hasn't been this wide in 25 years. The labor force participation rate, the percentage of blacks for that. Uh, working or looking for work, hasn't been this low since 1977. Uh, black home equity down, black home ownership is down, yet Joe Biden has sat there and has not quarreled with any decision that Obama has made. If he were to jump in right now, he would be the front runner. It drives me crazy. Well, and that's why you have to have a Republican candidate who's willing to hold Joe Biden accountable for what happened under the Obama administration. Now, the question is, Will we have a Republican candidate who's willing to do that or not? We haven't seen that come out of the Republican establishment for a long, long time. And if they would just be willing to be articulate and put the position out there, I think they'd have a very good chance. But again, on a practical level, people want to like the President of the United States. And, and it's a good thing that we naturally want to give respect to our president. I respect President Obama. I don't agree with him. I do respect him. I respect the office of the presidency, as we all should. Because at the end of the day, we are all Americans. But I absolutely disagree with the direction that the president has taken our country and the direction that he's, he's taking the world. He didn't just fundamentally transform America. He has fundamentally transformed the world, which is a pretty amazing thing to say with the way that he has reset the table, and not for the better, unfortunately. Let's just talk about Kennedy's gaffe. How bonehead was it for him to go on television uh, and when asked about what kinds of things have you done, he said, well, uh, essentially, had we not set up the Benghazi committee, Hillary would be a lot more popular right now, but now because we set up this committee, she's very unpopular. No one would have thought that, he said, as opposed to saying, we set up the committee because five Americans are dead, including the ambassador. Uh, we set up the committee to find out why there wasn't security at the Benghazi compound. We set up the committee to find out why Susan Rice goes on all these Sunday chat shows and gives this bogus story about a video. What was he thinking? Well, what, what is tragic about that comment is that it wasn't true. Because Trey Gowdy, who was the head of the Benghazi committee and Speaker Boehner to his credit, and every member that was on the committee, as well as I sat in the Republican conference and meeting after meeting, it was stated unequivocally over and over and over, this is no political witch hunt. We are not going to do that. We are not going to disrespect the memory of these people who were killed. We're about getting the facts and that's all we care. Don't anybody go out in public and even jump the gun on any conclusion. All we're gonna do is bring out the facts and follow the facts. That's it. This isn't about 2016 or anything. And what is so tragic is that's exactly the way the Republicans were doing. They were conducting this right. It wasn't a witch hunt. It was truly about getting to the facts. Kevin McCarthy knows that. And my guess is nobody regrets those comments more than Kevin McCarthy. Not because it will deny him the speakership, but because what it has done now is put a taint over what was actually a very ethical above board process and will continue to be an above board process, but it has, I think, brought about um, political damage, not only that it was unnecessary, but it, it doesn't respect and revere exactly what was happening, the facts of this committee. I wanna ask you about the, the way Republicans are handling the question about the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. Jeb Bush was asked that when he first announced and he first said that he would have supported the war then he said he wouldn't have supported the war. I'm not quite sure what his position is. What I don't understand is, uh, Michelle, during the dark old days of 9-11, of 90% of Americans thought we were going to get whacked again within six months to a year. Mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein was shooting at the British and American planes patrolling the southern and no-fly zones. He was stealing from the so-called oil for food program. We know he had chemical weapons at one time because he used them on the Iranians, he used them on the Kurds. He was sending $25,000 to homicide bombers in Israel. He had tried to assassinate the first president, George Herbert Walker Bush. 
And yet now Republicans are acting like it was some sort of bonehead mistake. 16, we have 16 intelligence agencies. All 16 said at the highest level of probability, there's no such thing as 100% certainty, at the highest level of probability, Saddam Hussein had stockpiles of chemical and biological weapons. I don't understand what other decision George W. Bush could have made given what, what he thought at the time. Well, Larry, you've, you've made the case. It's what Republicans should have been doing all along. What you did very effectively is you gave one fact after fact after fact on the ground that led to George Bush's decision with going into Iraq. The ultimate conclusion is that we secured the peace in Iraq. Saddam Hussein was gone, the peace was secured. What is tragic is that that cost the American taxpayer thousands of American lives and almost a trillion dollars to secure that peace. Iraq was in pretty good shape. What I don't agree with was the idea of nation building, that you can go in and somehow uh, turn Iraq into a democracy. That's not our job. That's a big mistake. What is good is for the United States to stand up for American national security interests. What you just did is explain America's national security interest in being involved initially in Iraq. We were able to go in and secure the peace. A lot of dumb things were done in Iraq with thinking again that we could nation build. We had no business doing that, but we secured it. Once the peace that was secured, tragically, when President Obama was president, he chose not to secure a status of forces agreement. A status of forces agreement means that the United States troops would stay in Iraq to keep it safe, just like we have troops today in South Korea to secure the peace. We need those troops in South Korea because of the aggression that is coming down from North Korea. President Obama chose not to do that. When the United States troops left Iraq, it sounded great for President Obama's reelection uh, chances, not so great once the uh, beheaders and rapists came in to take over Iraq with the Islamic State. They've been wildly successful from their point of view. And the Islamic State, as recently as August 28th, um, took a little 12-year-old kid and cut off his thumbs and cut off the ends of his fingers because he was a Christian. This has been all about Christian extermination in the Middle East. And the Islamic State not only did that, they also beat this kid to a pulp and crucified him. Then they publicly raped women before they slit their throats and crucified them. Then they beat the father of this 12-year-old boy. Then they, uh, they crucified him. This is what's been going on. None of this would have happened. This was all preventable if we would have kept a status of forces agreement and we would have kept American forces where they were trying to build up the Iraqi army, which clearly was unable to maintain the peace. Right. They can't do it now. The Afghan army can't do it now. Uh, we just lost what the Afghan president's name is Ghani. Ghani was just talking about, uh, I think it's called pronounced Kunduz, the city that um, he said, this is our model of how local Afghans can control Kunduz. The right. Taliban just came in about two weeks ago and took over the so-called model city. And then we all heard about this tragedy where there is a little 12-year-old Afghan boy who is chained to the bed of a local Afghan police officer who's trying to take over and help run Afghanistan. This little boy was used as a sex slave by this local Afghan police officer for two weeks. The mother was sick. She went in and tried to get the release of her little boy. And she was beaten up by this thug local Afghan policeman. So she went to the local Marines and said, would you help my son? Who wouldn't? Would you help my son? The two Marines went and found this local Afghan policeman. He admitted that this is what he was doing. They said, you can't do that. Uh, it was run up the food chain with the military command, US command. And the order is, you tell local authorities in Afghanistan, we stay out because we have to respect their culture. That's what they do in their culture. We're the protectorate in Afghanistan. There are certain values in my mind that are universal. I'm a mom to five biological kids, and I'm a mom to 23 foster kids. So I'm the old lady in the shoe. I got 28 kids. <laughs> One thing you don't do, you don't stand by 
when a little 12 year old boy is being repeatedly raped by anybody. That's not respecting cultural values. That is child abuse, severe, sick child abuse. And that happened under, is happening under our watch. And guess what? These two Marines are in the process of getting booted out of the Marines when they were only trying to be helpful in this situation. So this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. We have got to get our act together when we go into these countries, and we've got to get over this problem of political correctness, right. and we've got to do the right thing. You, when you do the right thing, it is the right thing. Regarding, regarding pulling out the troops in December of 2011, Obama did this over the objection of Robert Gates, his Secretary of Defense. He did it over the objection of Hillary Rodham Clinton. He did it over the objection of his CIA director, Leon Panetta. Uh, and Robert Gates wrote a book as scathing as any book you've ever seen uh, about a sitting commander in chief. And he said not only did, in his opinion, Obama want to get out of, uh, out of Iraq, he also wanted to get out of Afghanistan. Donald Trump, are you impressed? I haven't mentioned Donald Trump until just now. <laughs> Donald Trump, regarding uh, what's going on right now in the Middle East, says that he would just let uh, Russians and uh, Assad and ISIS fight it out among themselves. What is your opinion of that? Well, what's happened is that the United States has been evicted from the Middle East for the first time in any of our memories. That's never happened before. Again, the United States effectively had our rear end handed to us on the more early morning hours of September 30th. A three-star Russian general went into the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. I've been there. And we now know that this whole operation in the Middle East is being run out of um, Russia, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, all got together right next door to the U.S. Embassy and under our noses put this together. Russia is not there to get rid of the Islamic State in the way that we want the Islamic State gotten rid of. What Russia is about is Russia. What Iran is about is Iran. What China is about is China. And by the way, China flies low under the radar screen. They're involved into this just as much as anyone else. Because what they're about to do is, again, as I stated, they're looking at securing all the chokeholds of the Middle East because they want to control the distribution of the fossil fuels in the world, oil and uh, gasoline. As a matter of fact, Russia just announced a week ago that they're going to be going into Antarctica, down in the Arctic. They intend to lay claim to all of the natural resources that are in the Arctic and Antarctica. They're there about themselves. They're not there to just get rid of the Islamic State. Iran hates the Islamic State because Iran is a Shia nation. The Islamic State is Sunni Islam. So Iran plans to get rid of uh, the Islamic State. And uh, what you see is you have gypsies, tramps, and thieves right now all over the Middle East. And they may have the same enemy in some cases, but they also have different interests as well. And so they're going in league now against the United States. But can you imagine if you're Israel? Can you imagine? Who has Israel's back now? There is no country in the world, none. For the first time since Israel's existence, May 14th, 1948, for the first time, nobody has their back. 11 minutes after Israel announced her sovereignty in May of 1948, a Democrat president, Harry Truman, said, we recognize the Jewish state of Israel. And from 11 minutes after her birth forward, we've always had Israel's back. That door slammed on July 20th when the Iran agreement was signed. And since then, it's been more of the same. When Benjamin Netanyahu stood up at the UN, he was very clear. The silence is deafening. The Ayatollah in Iran has said, in 25 years, Israel, you won't exist. We're going to annihilate you. Five days after the Iran agreement was signed, the Ayatollah says, our policy toward the US hasn't changed. We're going to annihilate the US. These are bad actors. Bad actors that are going to be trillion dollar wealthy terror states with nuclear weapons. We've never been in a time like this before in world history, ever. And I don't want a chance what's going to happen with a nuclear Iran. 
That's why the best thing that could happen right now, and I begged President Obama to do this the last time I spoke to him as a member of Congress, to please do what we've done before, take out those instruments of death in Iran before the Ayatollah uses them against the United States and kills millions of innocent people. And by the way, it is the West Coast that is most at risk from a nuclear Iran. What about LA, the San Francisco, Liberty? that's what's at risk. What about the USS Liberty? I, I got it covered, sir, thank you. <laughs> um, so you are Commander in Chief Michelle Bachman. Tell me what you do to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Well, it's very simple. The first thing you do is you work with our allies who want to stop Iran. We're talking Arab allies uh, with Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait. Uh, we have a number, Jordan, Egypt, together with Israel, together with the UK, with France. You pull together our allies. This can be done fairly quickly. Over a period of about six to eight weeks, we have the capability today of flattening the uh, nuclear instruments of death. That is the, pl um, the plutonium factory in Iraq, A-R-A-K, and also the uranium enrichment facilities that they have built. You're not dropping a bomb on little kids. You're not dropping a bomb on a senior citizen center or a shopping center. We're very precise. We can take a bomb and we can take out that speaker right there. We're that good. So we know exactly where these instruments of death are located. We can get them out and over a period of six to eight weeks, we would have the job done in all of Iran. In what universe would you not deny to a maniac like the Ayatollah of Iran the instruments of death which he has vowed to use and now he'll have access to 150 billion immediately to get his project going and a trillion over 10 years. Why wouldn't you deny him the ability to achieve his goal which is a genocidal death of every Jew he can kill, and also the United States of America. Any sane president would do that. That's what I would do on the first day. Michelle, why do you think Israel has not done this already? Because um, Israel is the size of New Jersey. They fight above their weight, but they're not the United States. They're not Russia. They are not a superpower. And they've always had the luxury of the United States having their back. That's the problem. I also went to meet privately with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu after I left the presidential race in 2012. Because I saw with President Obama pulling out of Iraq that our allies, literally Ara Iraqis who laid their life down for us, we were thinking on them. And those allies who laid down their life for us, now we're getting their throats slit. I personally talked to an interpreter in the airport in Kabul who told me that he had gotten his golden ticket. He was going to get out of Afghanistan after being one of our interpreters, and he was going to get out and take his wife and his kids. He said a month before, his cousin had his throat slit because the Taliban knew that this guy I was talking to was helping the Americans. You see, that's what we did. We finked on all these Iraqis who gave their lives for us, and they got their throats slit in exchange. Millions, not millions, thousands of people have gotten their lives, they have lost their lives. Ten thousands of people have lost their lives since the Islamic State came in. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember where I started out, what your question was, and if I, I, I got on another tangent, I'm the, sorry. The, the question was, why didn't Israel do this already? Oh, they? oh, the reason why Israel didn't do it is because this is a big deal. Because as you can imagine, I mean, Israel's under attack now. Two Orthodox rabbis were just stabbed this morning, 14 in this last week. Um, there is a current effort by Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, to whip up more violence in the West Bank right now. And another rocket was just uh, blown into Israel from Hamas in Gaza. They are under attack now. And by the way, about 200,000 Iranian rockets are on Israel's northern border by Hezbollah, Iranian-backed, um, in southern Lebanon, pointed at Israel. They're in a very tough neighborhood. If they try on their own to go to Iran to take out nuclear facilities, there's more than one. There's multiples. If they go to do it by themselves, this is a very difficult proposition to do. Very difficult, because as I said, with our allies, we would get the job done, but it would take us six to eight weeks. 
If Israel does it on her own, she will be attacked within about 10 minutes of dropping its first bomb on Iran. Who's going to be there to have their back? Who's going to be there to help them? Again, they're the size of New Jersey. 80% of all Israelis live or work in the Tel Aviv area. 80%. It takes one nuclear bomb to take out pretty much Israel. One well-placed bomb. And the Iranians know that. That's why they're saying to themselves, they're giddy. We're going to have this done. Our goal of annihilating Israel, it's going to be done in less than 25 years. This is a very different world we live in. And so what Israel needed to know is that they can't t afford to tick off the United States. And they certainly weren't going to tick off Barack Obama. Even though Barack Obama was making foolish, tragic decisions, they couldn't afford to tick him off. Because it's very difficult for them to carry this out on their own. And what is tragic is that so many of these intelligence leaks that came out cut the legs out of Israel. The first one being our former Defense Secretary, Leon Panetta, in the back of Air Force One, said to the media, well, we have intelligence that Israel is going to uh, bomb in Iraq in Iran in two months. Why would you say that? Why would you tell the media and the world that Israel's going to do that? It's like, why would that happen? The next piece that came out was um, the leak that Israel had struck an agreement with um, Saudi Arabia and Azerbaijan. They were going to refuel planes in Azerbaijan because they saw that they might have to go and take out these, these Iranian nuclear facilities. Then the, then the United States leaked that information. Every intelligence leak had two commonalities. One was to cut out the legs of Israel. The other one was advancing the goals of Islamic Jihad. Why would we want to do that? What is unbelievable to me is that the United States was taking the position of advancing the goals of the Ayatollah of Iran. His goal is nuclear weapons. Why would we help him do that? Why would we give him $150 billion? Why wouldn't we do everything we could to make his life miserable? Instead, we're going to hold training and workshops for the Iranians to teach them how to defeat anyone who'd want to sabotage their nuclear program. We've signed up that we, with our treasure and our soldiers, are going to defend the Iranian nuclear facility.